in there's more representation in everything we watch and see that we're seeing all these different ideals of what beauty can look like and realizing that every single one of us is beautiful there's not a specific size or shape welcome to the my future business show where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business so at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name is Rick Nusky. I am your host. It's wonderful to have you back with us, and it's also wonderful for me to be your host because I love bringing you this show because I get to spend some time with incredibly talented people. And speaking about incredibly talented people today, I'm going to be spending some time with the wonderful Gemma Rain Fountain. Welcome to the show, Gemma. Hi, thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Now, you and I were just touching on, uh, you know, the move away from uh, coffees to, you know, a chai tea and no milk and all these wonderful things that we need to consider as we uh, move towards a bit, I guess, a better version of ourselves. But uh, for context, Gemma, I'd just love to share with the uh, the audience that you are a certified health coach. You're an exercise physiologist. Uh, you're an author and speaker. And we're going to be talking about the importance of mental health first and foremost in your journey to health and fitness and or weight loss, along with some, I guess, some practical steps of how people can get there. So um, with all that being said, where are you calling in from today, Gemma? I am in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the United States. Now, what's the weather like for you over there at the moment? It's absolutely gorgeous. We were, um, it was a little bit warm today. We've had the air conditioning running, but the kids and I and my husband were in the backyard most of the day. So oh, for lovely. those people listening, then it's still winter. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Look, uh, <laughs> And now you're an expat. I'd love to um, wind back, uh, I guess, the wheels of time a little bit, Gemma, and talk about your life prior to moving to where you are now. I was wondering if you could share with us. Well, honestly, you know, I was, I was nine when I left the UK. And so I don't have an awful lot of, of memories from there. Mm -hmm. We moved to Florida just before I turned 10 years old, yep. back in 1987. Oh, wow. And my, my parents moved here to open businesses. And so um, my, you know, I, I remember my school, I remember my house, but I don't have a ton of memories of the United Kingdom. It drives my mother nuts. <laughs> we're going back there. We're going back there in a few months and it drives her nuts because I have no idea about British history or British geography. <laughs> I am so ignorant to it. And it is like my mom to her. It's like nails dragging down a chalkboard. Oh. She's like, how can you not know? No. I said, well, <laughs> I've been in the U S I was, I was raised here in this education system. So that's fair um, enough. I, I've been taught this, but yeah, I grew up an immigrant here in the United States and, and that had, um, you know, a lot of challenges here for me, but I'm a U.S. citizen now and my husband is American, my kids are American, and mm -hmm. as you can hear, I yes. sound very American. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're all, uh, we all have two feet and a heartbeat in that regard, we're all the same regardless of where we are and, uh, you know, right now I think uh, the world needs a bit of a, a light heart of approach to human beings and respect for each other, that's for sure and certain now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know I that I know that uh, your parents uh, you just mentioned were starting businesses as they came over. Um, tell me, what have you learned from people around you in your formative years about business? Because you've gone on to be very successful. I think you know, um, having entrepreneurial parents, you learn you learn the hustle, and I think you know this this might sound awful but you kind of also learn what not to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and my parents had great work ethic and they were big dreamers i mean to dream you know in the in the late 80s to dream of leaving their country where they've spent their whole life with a child and relocate to across the world really to open businesses without you know there was no internet back then there was no you know you didn't have um resources to do all your market research and and whatnot so they kind of came over here with a dream and they they forged a better life here for me mm -hmm. but i don't think they ever created what they had built in the u.s in the uk in the uk they um they owned hair salons and hair schools and they used to teach people all over the country how to be hairdressers and they worked with you know um prestigious magazines and prestigious big names in hair we never quite recreated that here in the united states mm -hmm. and 
that was hard for me to watch them go through because as you can imagine going from being a big fish in a little pond to being a small fish in a big pond mm. that can have its that can really affect ego i think and it can affect your enthusiasm yep. i suppose yep. and so they never quite found it here in the us however i know that my life and the opportunities i've had here I, I know for certain I would not have had them over in the UK. And so I'm very thankful that they were dreamers and that they were entrepreneurs and that they did take that leap for, you know, it's definitely benefited my, benefited my life. But I think, you know, you learn how to hustle. You learn that the business comes first and that, you know, no one else will do it for you. You don't mm. have someone else down the chain who's going to take up your slack if you don't do it. It is you. And so I think having entrepreneurial parents definitely gave me that work ethic to understand what it is to be an entrepreneur and to have my own businesses because I watched them do it. It was them or nobody. Yeah. So I think that's definitely something I learned. That's incredible feedback. Thank you so very much for sharing. Now, what's your philosophy around failure? I know you've seen a little bit of it, but- uh, I've seen a lot of it. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a ton of failure. And um, I'll tell you this though, I have learned more from every single failure I've ever had than I ever learned from the successes. And I think um, because I am quite vocal with, you know, my following, my clients, um, I mean, I'm in health and fitness. So to the classes I was teaching um, in, in my content, I'm very open about the things I do that didn't quite hit the mark. Mm. And I think that makes me more relatable. It helps me connect with my audience even better because it is normal. We're going to fail. And I think if you don't fail, you're not trying. And mm. so I'm not mad at failure. I can, you know, I get a little disheartened sometimes mm. and I get a little frustrated, but when I stop and take account of really all the things I've done in my life, and I think it's important to, to remember that the things I wished for 10 years ago, I have now. And yeah. I'm going to make wishes now and I'm going to have set goals now. And in 10 years, I will reach the goals that really were meant for me. And the things that weren't meant for me will pass me by. And I think just living in the moment, finding the joy in every day is critical to being okay with those failures because they don't define us. You've got uh, a couple of things on your side, more than a couple, I'd say. You've got tenacity, commitment, consistency. You've, you're a goal setter. We've touched on the people in your earlier, I guess, your formative years. Now, um, as your circle of influence expands, you would be exposed to different types of personalities. Have any other people influenced the way you think about how you run your business? Um, I think, I mean, I think there's been specific things said, you know, because mm -hmm. I have, you know, an, in personal training, because my, my health and fitness business, I have some amazing personal training clients over the year, years, and a lot of them have been highly successful people. And, you know, you think of conversations and seeds they planted within me over the years. I remember um, one client of mine, a millionaire, and he had had many failures, many successes. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned something, oh, maybe I'll do that in another life. And he said to me, he said, Gemma, you have many lives in this lifetime. And that was something that hit me very hard because I stopped and looked back on my time and on this earth. And really I have had many lives and I will have many more. It depends what we focus on. And our life can change drastically in a very short period of time if we decide to put the work in. Or if we decide not to put the work in, it can change the opposite direction, right? And not for the better. Yeah. And so we have many lives we can live. So I think that was very, very impressive upon me when that client said that. Mm -hmm. And then also finding, you know, it was hard for me at the beginning to admit that I needed help and I needed coaching. Mm -hmm. I would read books, but I felt like when I was becoming beginning my entrepreneurial journey, I had this feeling that I had to have it all figured out so that people would respect me. And I probably set myself back many years by having that attitude. And when I finally let go of my ego and realized that I cannot do this alone and that I have so much to learn and people can teach me and I opened myself up to coaches 
that's when things really started to change for me. So I have done a couple of programs online. I've hired business coaches that have made a huge difference. And having that kind of support and having a coach to go to, having a sounding board who isn't my friend or my mm-hmm. husband mm-hmm. or God forbid my mom because she, <laughs> she disagrees with everything, right? Um, having someone who is there to coach me in my business has been absolutely priceless. Yeah, that's, that's uh, wonderful feedback. There'll be a lot of people on the call today taking a great deal of value away from the things that you're saying. Now, I know you speak very highly of your family, your direct family, as do I of my own, and they are the salt of the earth for me, as they are for you, I suspect. Now, Gemma, I'm wondering if you can tell me um, what part do they play um, to keep you focused each and every day? They are they're the dream. They're my vision. Um, mm-hmm. I think before having children, life was very different. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was very driven. I worked very hard, but I didn't really know what I was working for. Yeah. I, I didn't, you know, I'm not a very materialistic person. Yes, I want money to do things, but that doesn't drive me. Um, my passion is to help people and make a difference. And before children, I gave a lot of my skills away and probably hurt my industry. <laughs> <laughs> because I gave away things that I had learned and it took me years and lots of money to get educated and I gave them away. And um, having children really let me realize that I had to know my worth. I, I had to be paid for my time because now my time was infinitely more valuable because if I'm not with my family, Yep. I better be getting paid enough to not be with them. Yeah, wow. So it wasn't just the paying for my knowledge and paid for my years of experience. You better make it worth it because if it's not worth it, I, I have somewhere better to be. Yeah, that, you, yeah. Oh, that absolutely makes great sense because many times I've had people ask similar questions. Well, why isn't it free? It's because I value my time and the services that you provide, Gemma, are along the lines of anything, anyone who provides a level of value, you need to be rewarded for the skills and experience because you can't buy those things, can you? Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I'm not afraid to toot my own horn. I'm very, very good as, mm. as in my industry. Mm-hmm. You know, now I'm mainly, I'm a health coach. Yep. And I, I, as you said, I focus on the, the mental health side of fitness and weight loss and nutrition because people have mental blocks around these things. People know what they should and shouldn't eat. Yep. They know they should move. They know how to exercise, but they don't do it. And so I help people really overcome the mental blocks And it's taken me 20 years. Um, 20 years ago, people weren't talking about this. They weren't talking about the mental health side. So I had to self-educate. I had to go find resources. And I went back to school to get more education. And then I've practiced on myself. I've practiced with previous clients. And I've honed a skill set where I can help people very, very quickly in the most amazing, beautiful, powerful ways in a very short period of time. Now that that's worth a lot oh you yeah know? there's absolutely. a there's a quote that i um i'm going to mess it up but i think like it was a quote where a famous artist was sitting at a coffee shop and someone walked up and said oh can you draw a picture on my napkin and the artist did and then the artist said okay that'll be you know two thousand dollars and the person said well it only took you a minute to draw it he goes well it took me 40 years to be able to do that in one minute yes And so that's, you know, I can help someone very quickly because of all my experience, all my knowledge, all my reading, all my own personal journey I've been through, I'm able to really help people get through their mental blocks very quickly. You're not paying for the quickly. You're paying for what got me to the point where I could help you quickly. (laughs) And so, yeah, we have to know our worth. And it's hard, I think, start for many people. It was very hard for me in my beginning of my entrepreneurial business and my entrepreneurial journey to say this is what I'm worth and dang it, that's what I'm gonna demand. It was hard for me to get to this point. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, I think this is about a a value proposition that you have earned and it is a real credit to you. And I think there's a lot of value being shared today on the call thus far already. Now, when you spend your time, I'd just like to double back on the family a little bit and in terms of what you like to do, what do you guys do in your downtime when you spend time together? 
we are very simple. We have a beautiful backyard and a garden, mm -hmm. and we love to just get outside and play. So if we are not out in our amazing city, because St. Petersburg, Florida is a beautiful, amazing city, oh, yeah. we're shooting basketball out front ah. on the front hoop. <laughs> we're in the back. We're, we're playing wiffle ball. Or we're playing soccer. Or we're hanging out with the dog. We have a beautiful dog. And, you know, really it's about creating, for us as a family, creating memories without having to be overstimulated. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because theme parks, mu you know, museums, going downtown to festivals, those things are fantastic. But we prefer a very slowed down pace and just focusing on being together and, and having amazing joy without having to have influences or overstimulation or spend a ton of money like i said we're minimalists yep. and so we really focus on the the simple pleasures of life you know that's great um, yep. making popcorn you know fresh popcorn <laughs> in the pan and and cuddling up on the couch and watching a movie or we love to do bonfires in the backyard and and make s'mores we oh, some like s'mores. to grill now I'm hungry. out oh <laughs> the kids love it and we love to grill out in the backyard and have friends over we like to keep it very simple and and we keep our circle very small and just, you know, focus on just quality time together. That's a family first focus. <coughs> and, you know, I love that. That's very much, you've just mimicked exactly what we love doing as well. So, you know, it'd be wonderful to catch up sometime, even though we're halfway across the world from each other. Now, I wonder, um, you know, when you are, um, when you were growing up, you know, just as you are uh, spending time with your kids and giving them great memories, what are some of the great memories that you can recall from your childhood? Um, then we're, now we're getting into a whole other subject. Um, I had a rough childhood. Mm. You know, my parents, um, they, when they moved over to America, they struggled. They struggled in their relationship. They struggled financially. Like I said, they, they didn't quite get the success here. Mm. And so I'm, I'm an only child, and I was, I was very much a loner, kind of, you know, me and my bike and wherever we could go. Yep. And so I didn't have that kind of upbringing. There aren't too many memories like that. It was me and the dog and the television. Uh. So I think that's why I'm so passionate now about making sure we have so much time together because it's so important to me because I missed out on it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I know that that could be very hard. And there are other people in the world um, that are uh, going through a similar experience. They might be living it right now listening to this show. So it might be very useful for them to maybe, um, you know, unfold and uh, open that book a little bit again during our time together. If that's all right, Gemma. Now, um, let's go back to, um, I guess, the start of why this all came about from you and the story behind, um, you know, your eating habits early on. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and how it impacted your mental state. Absolutely. As a child, um, like I said, my parents, they, they struggled and they, you know, when you're not happy, there's, there was depression, there was sadness, there was frustration. And um, there was no, there were very few home cooked meals. Mm. Um, you know, my parents would go to the store to get their cigarettes and grab me a cheesecake. Now I'm allergic to dairy, but cheesecake was dinner. Oh, wow. And, or I'd babysit local families and make enough money to get a pizza delivered. Again, yep. covered in cheese. I was allergic, I'm allergic to dairy. <laughs> and so I And was, you didn't know it at the time, did you? I think we knew it from an early age, right. but no one in my family taught me what that meant. Oh. I just thought that feeling terrible was Part life. Part of the deal. I had tummy ache all the time. I was always bloated, always had gas. It was, you know, it was embarrassing, especially as a teenage girl. Oh, yeah. But I had no one to teach me. And again, pre-internet, you know, mm -hmm. and no one was talking about it. So mm -hmm. I just felt ill most of the time. And then I would gain weight and then I didn't want to gain weight. So I would stop eating. And so I had this terrible relationship with food because I didn't know any better. And I would gain weight, lose weight. Um, I didn't have any concept of nutrition at all whatsoever. Mm. Um, gosh, at one point I was eating an apple a day. And then when I would finally eat food, it would be so painful to digest it because I hadn't digested any food in so long. It oh. actually caused me pain. Yeah. I mean, I just, I was a young kid with very little guidance. And then I just, whatever crazy idea I read in a magazine or heard another kid at school say, I latched onto it and tried it. Yep. And it definitely was not healthy for me. No. And then 
in high school, I think on my 16th birthday, I declared I was vegetarian. So what do you do with someone who doesn't know how to eat and, and doesn't feel well? Well, you limit their choices even more <laughs> and you become vegetarian, <laughs> which limited even more choices. And I, I did not know how to eat. So it was McDonald's French fries. It was a Taco Bell bean burrito with no cheese. Um, this was my nutrition, these are my nutritional sources. And so I wasn't well, I was always sick. I always had a cold, I always had allergies. And it took a long time for me to really start learning it. And I tried every fad diet that came out. And when I finally did start eating meat again, my health improved a lot. So that's how I learned that my body does not like being a vegetarian. Everyone, everybody's different. This is what yeah. I do as a health coach. Is yep. Vegetarianism works for some people. Veganism works for some people. It doesn't work for others. We have to figure out what works best for us. And I'll tell you, Rick, I didn't actually really figure out how to eat for my body until I was 30. Wow. And it was when I was 30 and I'd been exercising. I'd been in the gym. Mm -hmm. I'd been eating what I thought was healthy food. Um, but I was still eating a lot of sugar, a lot of carbohydrates. Portion size was way too large. So I thought I, I thought I was doing the right thing, but it wasn't right for me. And when I was 30 and I finally, I met someone who taught me all about how to cook, yep. um, how to cook protein properly, how to cook at home, how to meal prep, how to make sure I was eating enough calories because I was under eating. And finally, for the first time since I was a teenager, I liked the way I looked. So from the age of 15 to the age of 30, living in Florida, Living, I could throw a stone to the beach yep. and never went to the beach in a bathing suit. Oh, wow. 15 years. My friends would skip school in high school and go to the water park. They'd be out on boats. They'd be, have beach days. And I wouldn't go to any you of them. I wouldn't go. I missed parties. I missed events because I was so self-conscious. I was so down on myself about my body and the way I looked. I lost 15 years of joy, 15 years 15. of my life Can't get it back. Being, being lost there. Yeah. And so to, you know, to learn what my body needed and to feel healthy and feel good and not be on this bloating roller coaster I was on, it was definitely, it was life changing. I, I often think about um, our body shape and, and I wonder, um, some people have underlying health issues that stop them from changing their body shape, but yet they embrace who they are. Um, what do you think about that in, in terms of, you know, the mindset about who you are? That's one of the number one things I coach is that, you know, people often think, oh, when I lose the weight, then I will love myself. Mm. And I challenge everybody that we have to reverse that. Because if we are trying to lose weight from a place of punishing ourselves, bullying ourselves, um, forcing ourselves to fit a certain mold, we're going at it from a very harmful, painful place. Whereas if we learn to love ourselves now, just as we are, perfections and imperfections and all, extra pounds and whatever, we're going to love it because it's us. Yep. And then when you start to move your body, you can call it exercise, call it movement. When you start to move your body, you're moving your body because you love your body. Yeah. You start eating foods that nourish you because you love your body. And when you're making healthy decisions out of a respect for the body you're in and because you love the body you're in and you're honoring yourself, that is much more joyful place to be in versus punishing yourself by forcing yourself to go run the mile, forcing yourself to skip the meal that you wanted. It's a sad place to spend time. And I think so many of us have spent decades there. Yeah. We've been bullying ourselves to try and fit an ordeal or an ideal that might not be for us. Our body might never be that shape. And if we're trying to be something that we're not and we're not going to be, we're going to just stay in this sad place. And I don't ever want anyone to be there. My goal for my clients is to get you loving yourself as fast as possible. And then we'll deal with if you want to lose weight, we'll deal if you want to increase your cardiovascular activity, if you want to increase your strength, we'll worry about that after the fact. But first and foremost, we've got to love ourselves just the way we are. Lovely, lovely feedback. Absolutely love it. Now, I, I wonder, I think to myself, well, um, 
when you were, um, I guess, early into it, you had a, a period of time when you went through imposter syndrome. Tell us a little bit about that experience and what it meant to you. It was, um, I think, the beginning, you know, in the health and fitness industry, I, I felt like I had to look a certain way. Mm. And I didn't. And so how can people want to hire me as their personal trainer or their, you know, coach when I don't look the right way? Nah, yeah. And that's where a lot of my issues came from. And, you know, I didn't fit the stereotypical mold the first, you know, 10 years of my career because I didn't know how to eat. I was under eating, overeating, still eating dairy, mm. um, drinking way too much alcohol. I was just bloated constantly. And I remember that look people gave like, oh, you're a fitness instructor. And then ah. I look me up and down mm -hmm. and I, well, their looks might have meant nothing. They might have been looking at me like, dang, you look great. You're so healthy. But I took it as a judgment. And uh, I have no idea. The people who looked at me like that, I have no idea what they were thinking at that time. No. But because of my own insecurities and my own low self-esteem, I interpreted those looks negatively. You painted and the picture. So I, yeah. And so I spent a lot of time thinking, who am I? I don't even look like... I belong in this industry and that was hard it was hard to and it and probably it hindered my uh, hindered what i went for in my career it hindered opportunities it definitely affected me these are incredibly powerful insights that i know a lot of people would be taking a great deal of value away from now i want to know your take on the impact that media is having on particularly young individuals growing up in a world that seems to have a certain expectation about shape Tell us a little I bit wrote about a, that. I wrote a huge paper on this, on the negative effect of media on female body image mm. um, quite some time ago. Um, and that was before social media. Yep. And how you did, you saw airbrushed images on magazines, and we thought that was what a body looked like. Mm. And so when we've got, now we've got filters on everything. We've yep. got people who, anybody and everybody who wants to spend, spend five minutes learning can airbrush pictures. And then I, I think actually, I do feel that we're all a lot more aware of it now. Mm. I think in the past, because it wasn't readily available to all of us, people didn't realize that those pictures are not real. I think now young people are even more aware that that is not real. It's not real. So yep. I have a prayer and a hope that they're aware of it and understand and there is a, a huge movement now about love yourself just as you are this is what i look like don't you dare airbrush me on that magazine cover <laughs> this is it. and and yes and so i see hope i see amazing hope that people are loving themselves there's now you know you see images and there's a there's magazines that don't airbrush stretch marks off women that this is what we look like this yep. is normal they're yep. not trying to um airbrush a thigh gap that yep. this is what normal thighs look like. And, you know, the filters on all the social media, on all reels and, and Snapchat, not Snapchat, TikTok and, yep. and the Instagram reels, the filters are getting ridiculous and good. The more ridiculous they get, the more we realize that that yeah. is not what people <laughs> look like, you know. And so it can be harmful. I think younger people are more affected by it. But I do feel that there's a bigger movement in the right direction that we're all beautiful. And I think you know, with different cultures around the world, they have different values and different ideals of what is beautiful. And because those cultures are having more of a voice in what we see, how we see it, and there's more representation in everything we watch and see, that we're seeing all these different ideals of what beauty can look like and realizing that every single one of us is beautiful. There's not a specific, specific size or shape. Yeah, that's wonderful feedback. I know it's all culminated into... Um, you putting you know pen to paper as it were and not only do you write other articles and papers but you've gone ahead and written this wonderful book called The Elephant in the Room. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes that book came it's called The Elephant in the Room How to Overcome Your Psychological Barriers to Weight Loss Success. I know it's the longest name ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen to longer. Be the name. <laughs> when I wrote it that had to be the name I, I would not budge. Um, but, you know, my mental blocks and my struggle over, you know, my body image and, 
and how I, you know, learned to love myself and then came to health on, from a more healthier way, a healthier angle versus bullying myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I started loving myself into wellness. And then stories from my clients and friends and people I've spoken with over the decades and their mental blocks that they've had to weight loss. And the book is really the main goal of the book is to let readers know that you're not alone. I think when I was struggling, I felt like I was broken. I thought I was doing all the right things, but not getting results. So I thought there was something wrong with me Mm -hmm. and that this, I'm just never going to reach my goals. And then from talking to people, we, I learned that other people felt the same way. They felt like they were broken and there was something wrong with them. And then clients would tell me that they were going through something and they think that they're the only one going through it because they've never heard anyone talk about it before. Yep. So the book openly says, look, these are things I've heard over and over again from clients. They're things I've struggled with. And so if you're going through this, you're not alone and you're not broken. And that can we just have an open conversation about some of the mental blocks that can prevent people from reaching their health goals so that we know that there's nothing wrong with us and we do know there's hope. So it's just the beginning of that conversation to say these are some of the things people struggle with mentally. You're, you're normal. If yeah. you're going through this, you are normal and there's hope. It's a stepping stone for, you know, further information and and maybe possibly connecting with you and and working with you to learn more about how to go about this in a more successful way, I guess you'd put it. Now, um, you have some other offerings. I'd love to learn a little bit about what's on your website. Could you share that with us, please? Well, actually, I'm giving the book away for free. Oh, there you go. So that is an option. No, so the book, actually, I have a copy here. I'll show you. This is the book. And it is actually, I'm, thank you. I'm giving it away for free. So my website is Mm gemmarainefountain.com. And if you go on there, you can sign up and I will send a a PDF copy of the book. If you prefer print, it is available on Amazon. But if you don't mind reading PDF, I will gift it to you for free just to get you starting thinking about those possible mental blocks. And there's also another offering on my website. It's the eight secrets of a body confident woman. So it's about having that body confidence long before you ever start talking about weight or nutrition, but loving yourself. How can we be more confident right now today without ever changing anything other than what's up here? That's fantastic. What a great call this has been. I know that there'd be a lot of people on the call that have, you know, suddenly gone to gemmarainefountain.com. And if you haven't had the time to do that just yet, don't worry, because I'll be making sure that the link back to gemmarainefountain.com is available below this post. No matter where you see it, you'll be able to get back to Gemma and all of her wonderful works. And Gemma, in closing, thank you so very much for joining me on the My Future Business Show today. Thank you, Rick, for having me. You have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.